Oh, great. Uh, I should probably share because I've got slides. So, oh, but I do not have the ability to do that. Um, it says the host has disabled that ability. One second. I'm going to fix that for you right now. Cool. Let's see, let's see if that works now. Can you do it? I could do it now. Yay. Okay. Let's do that. And so I'm sharing that. And then I probably should. That's not the last slide. I'm going to go to the first slide. And uh, come on here. Zoom has all kinds of. Uh, shoot. Well, what do you see? Do you see the. I see presenter view. You see presenter view. Yeah. All right. I can see the slides. Sometimes the depending on how you've got Zoom set up, the the shared window might be behind you. Uh, there we are. Window. You got That's it, Trevor. Yep. All right. Cool. Yeah, I figured just a just a quick shift to do it. Well, thanks, Joey, for that introduction. I will say a little bit more about myself as I get into this, but I'm grateful for the invitation and happy to be experimenting with our newfound uh, virtual connectivity. So this is a talk that I gave earlier this year at the Lean Agile US conference. Uh, Joey was there. Uh, we had the pleasure of also doing a workshop together in a very compressed time frame. Later on, we could talk about that if anybody's interested. But this uh, particular uh, talk is about the things that I have learned about leadership that I think are applicable to us as we think about agility uh, from Admiral Nimitz, who was commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet in World War II, and also a theater commander, commander of the uh, Pacific Ocean areas. As Joey mentioned, I uh, do a lot of work in uh, naval history. I, I am a naval historian as well as being a, an agilist, or agile coach, or a uh, management consultant. And I think that there is an awful lot of valuable information that we can draw on from historical perspectives to think about and reflect upon agile approaches as we try to work our way through them and apply them today. And I think there are some things in this talk that, that uh, you'll get out of that. So uh, this talk itself and some of the research that I'm doing now about Nimitz uh, are, are triggered by these kinds of questions. I have in prior research argued that the US Navy of the early 20th century is a complex adaptive system and that that lens is the best way to understand how it went about learning and innovating, uh, primarily in, in peacetime, but also in, in war. And if that's the case, if we've got a complex system with various agents that act in various ways based on constraints, and what is leadership in a system like that? What are the best kinds of things for leaders to do? And how should they behave when it's difficult to identify or tease out the relationships between cause and effect. And uh, when in circumstances when sometimes acting directly is not as impactful or, or as, as fruitful when trying to, to behave with influence. And I've, my orientation in this is very much shaped by uh, the work of Alicia Guerrero. Some of you may know her. She has influenced Dave Snowden's Kinevin framework with her work on uh, constraints and how complex systems evolve and adapt and, and, and learn. And one of the points that she likes to make is that you can't, you can't cause innovation to occur, but you can create the conditions that make it more likely to arise or to emerge. And so that's part of the, the background, part of my thinking here. And you'll see how that influences things as we go along. I've already done some basic introductions. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz's disposition and, and orientation. I said that he was commander in chief for the Pacific Fleet, also Pacific Ocean areas. That was a little unusual. Um, he had what was termed then an operational command, the fleet, uh, but also a theater command, the vast Pacific Ocean area. And uh, that, I think, helped shape or influence his behavior to it a certain extent. And I'm Sean Hone. Uh, a fellow at Excella, a managing consultant, and an enthusiast of Agile in various forms, and uh, 
as I mentioned earlier, I'm also a naval historian, won a few different awards. Uh, I'm more prepared to answer that question because after the talk at Green Hatchel US, some people ask me, well, what awards have you won? Um, the one that I'm most proud of and the most recent one is last year, I was the uh, US Naval Institute's author of the year for a book I published through them in 2018. So we will start at the beginning or at least at the beginning of the American entry in, into World War II, as, as you all know, that happened with the attack on, on Pearl Harbor. And at that time, uh, Nimitz was head of one of the Navy's technical bureaus, uh, specifically the Bureau of Navigation, which at the time was responsible for personnel assignments, particularly officers. Where would officers get staffed? Where would they go? And so Nimitz was focused on finding them roles that fit with their experience their skill sets and giving them new opportunities. And his offices were in what they called Maine Navy at the time, which was downtown in DC. It's all gone now, uh, but this is before the Pentagon. This is the old Navy Department offices. And when the uh, forces of Imperial Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the uh, President Roosevelt and Navy Secretary Frank Knox, pictured here, very quickly determined that they wanted new leadership in the Pacific for the Navy. And after talking about it relatively briefly, they decided that Nimitz would be a good candidate for that. So Knox goes to Nimitz and says, hey, look, we want you to take command of the Pacific fleet and uh, get out there, get going. I've got a plane and we can get you to uh, Hawaii as fast as possible. And in, in an act that I think is really, really very interesting, Nimitz says, no, I'm not going to go out there that fast. I'll take the job, but I'm not going to get on the plane. Instead, I'm going to be a little bit more deliberate, and I'm going to take uh, DNO uh, Capital Limited. I'm going to take that to Chicago. And then in Chicago, I'm going to go get a haircut on the Navy Pier, and then I'm going to take the, the Santa Fe to Los Angeles, and then from there south to San Diego. And that's where I'll get on a plane because, well, that's where we run out of train tracks and I need to get it on a plane at that point. But I'm going to take it a little bit more slowly. I'm going to be deliberate about taking some time to disconnect from my current role as head of the Bureau of Navigation and uh, orient myself to the challenges of, of the new opportunity in, in the Pacific. So he's, he's deliberately using what today we would call slack or downtime, right? So to transition from one role to another, he uses that opportunity uh, over uh, a few uh, old fashions, I think they were, to review what had happened uh, to the Pacific fleet, to review damage reports from uh, the attack, and to, to orient himself and familiarize himself with the new challenge, and also to rest. So there's this clear determination to, to make use of some flag. And I think everyone here, because we're all interested in agility and our practitioners of it, understand the value of slack. Uh, we don't have to be told that, but I think this is a nice, very clear, relatively high profile uh, example. This book, Tom DeMarco's book is a little longer the tooth now. It's not too recent anymore. Uh, but if you haven't, you haven't read it, haven't looked at it, I would encourage you to review it. Uh, because it, it provides in a succinct fashion a lot of the arguments that we tend to make about the value of the slack. If you want to dig a little bit deeper, I think the work of David Woods is extremely valuable in this context. Uh, he is at Ohio State University and he studies socio-technical systems. He's got some very uh, recent uh, thoughts about uh, the, the problems of the Boeing airplane and its accidents. And he argues that systems need adaptive capacity, which is very much like Slack, but uh, he's deliberate about the definition. This is the ability of a system, particularly the people in it, to gain some distance from their day-to-day -day or from the urgency of the moment in order to allow the disposition of the chain of, of the system to change, to, to be able to adapt. Uh, and it's, a, it's an attribute that you can run out of if you're too busy or getting pulled in too many different directions. And that's the point of that last bullet. Uh, the more highly specialized we become, the more efficient we are, uh, the less adaptable we tend to be. Now, back to the slides. Yep, so Nimitz arrives at Pearl Harbor, comes to, to Pearl Harbor. This is, this is about as uh, 
graphic as the as the pictures here are are, are going to get. This is um, the destroyers Tasman and and Downs that were in a um, uh, they were in, in this uh, dry dock in in front of Battleship Pennsylvania, and uh, they caught fire. As you can see by their blackened holes and so on. But Nimitz is confronted with this uh, the devastation. But his attitude is very interesting, I think. You know, this quote up above the title of the slide, it couldn't happen to anyone. That's sort of his orientation. He does not go about looking for blame. He doesn't think that we need to be figuring out, you know, who is responsible for this. It's very oriented towards, well, we, we need to move we need to move forward. And to some degree, I think that this is informed by the rich experience that he had. Naval officers of this time, a century or, or seventy five years ago, tended to move around uh, over the course of their career and gain exposure to a variety of different things within the Navy. This image here, for example, is one of the Navy's first diesel engines, and Nimitz was the Navy's foremost diesel engine expert in, in the team. He went to Germany before the outbreak of the First World War to learn German diesel technology, bring it back to the United States. He helped build this engine in New York that powered one of the Navy's colliers. And so he's developing rich technical expertise in a variety of different areas. He's also very uh, experienced at commanding submarines and operating submarines, often with diesel engines. And he was also no stranger to making mistakes. One of his first commands was the destroyer Decatur, which is uh, pictured here on the right. Its crew is on the left, and, and Nimitz is there in the middle of the front row as, as the young captain of this ship. And one evening in the in the Philippines, because that's where this ship happened to be, it was part of the Asiatic fleet, not too long after the turn of the century, uh, Nimitz was commanding the ship through some waters that weren't terribly well charted, and he ran it aground. And it was stuck, and they tried to get it off, and they couldn't get it off. And so the story goes that he, he pulled out a bamboo deck chair and just sort of sat there on the foredeck waiting for the tide to come up and also waiting for a merchant ship to come by to help pull the destroyer off, which he did. And so, you know, the ship survived, but he was, he was court-martialed for this. So he had a diversity of experience and he also, uh, had made a series of mistakes. So he had this background. And it does something very compelling when he comes to uh, assume command of the Pacific Fleet. At that time, it was traditional for a new commander to bring with him his staff, his preferred team, and people that he was familiar with, that he knew how to work with, and that's, that would just happen. The change of command would be not just change of command at the top, but change of command throughout the uh, upper level of the hierarchy. Nimitz deliberately chooses not to do this. He resolves to not bring any of his people on, at least not immediately. Instead, he keeps the existing Pacific Fleet staff. This is a picture of them early in 1942, not too long after he's assumed command. And he's made the choice to sort of forgive or redeem these individuals. Right? We're not going to try to find fault with what went wrong. We're not going to look for blame. Instead, we're going to focus on what do we do next. Where do we go from here? And he's very much focused on morale, and I think you can understand why. We think of the attack on, on Pearl Harbor with the distance that we have as something that uh, catalyzes the American people to action. And I think within the American public, there's certainly a lot of that. But if you look at its impact on the Navy in the Pacific, it's it's shocking, right? It, it disrupts and shatters the worldview of these naval officers. And so he, in close consultation with the, the senior surgeon, the, the doctor there in Pearl Harbor, decides, all right, I will keep the whole staff because everybody here has been through a bit of a shock, a trauma, and we're going to try to reinvigorate their morale. And I'm going to emphasize to them that their knowledge is really valuable. We can use it. We need their expertise to succeed and we're going to give them a chance. And I think this is a really neat, neat story. It makes me think of, or it resonates with uh, David Epstein's book, Range. And if you're not familiar with this, I 
definitely recommend it. It is an interesting look at how a broad base of knowledge and experience is really valuable for approaching problems. Epstein's basic point is that the more diverse perspective you can bring to problem solving, the more opportunities you're going to have to sort of reconfigure your viewpoint or approach the problem from different ways. And if you get the right sort of frame for solving a problem, the problem might become easier. The key is being able to do this kind of adaptation. And FC makes the point that a lot of times uh, there's sort of simple learning environments and there's wicked learning environments. Simple are ones where past history is easy to apply to the future. And he likes to pick on chess as an example of this, the game of chess, right? The rules of chess are well known. They've been out there for a long time. And there are very good people at, at chess, but chess is a, is a skill that you can sort of hone, develop, and get really good at. And we can program machines to do it well. Wicked learning environments are different because the rules are constantly changing. We're always encountering new situations that break the lessons that we already, already have. And if you've got familiarity with how to adapt and adjust through a range of experience, or your team has it through the range of their experience, then um, you can be better suited to solve and address problems in the future. And this also informs how Nimitz begins to approach working with the staff and, and working with the fleet. This is another ship that he commanded earlier in his career, it's the Cruiser Augusta. It was flagship of the Asiatic fleet in the early 1930s when he was its captain. And this is it pictured in Cindy Harbor. Some of you probably recognize the bridge. And at that time, the, the Navy was very invested in creating an atmosphere of competition in order to promote uh, achievement or, or uh, better routines, better practices. There would be a lot of different competitions. A lot of them were athletic, right? There would be uh, boating competitions or be swimming competitions. There might be uh, boxing competitions. A lot of them were team sports or riflery competitions, uh, competitions for how well uh, or efficiently ships could steam and make use of their oil and the competitions to determine how well and how accurately the ships could use their guns. And then it's tried very hard to ensure that Augusta was at the top rank of these various competitions. And the way that he tended to do it was to emphasize to the officers aboard this ship that it was their responsibility not only to try to do well in these competitions, but to encourage the growth and development of the individuals who were on the various teams or part of the various organizations that they were working with. Uh, there's a quote that one of these junior officers has in his oral history. It was basically that if you, as one of the officers on Augusta, did not take an interest in the development of uh, your men, the men in your group or the men on your team, then Nimitz would quietly find something else for you to do, go to a different ship or be transferred out. And another thing that he would typically do to help Inglegate, this culture of learning, was uh, bring in outside speakers. Because Augusta was part of the Asiatic fleet, it spent its time either in China or in the Philippines. And China at that time still does, it had a very international presence. So he'd bring in speakers either from uh, China itself or from other international uh, groups, diplomats, other military services from you know, Germany or Japan and get them to speak to the people uh, on Augusta to help broaden their perspective and introduce additional learning. And he brings this to the fleet, the Pacific fleet, as he takes control of it. And one of the things that he does is he tries to organize the staff in such a way, not only to give him a diversity of perspective, but to align members of the staff to their own or orientation, uh, to the things that they are good at. So, for example, his, his chief of staff is uh, a man named Milo Dremel. He's there on the left. And Dremel was a very effective planner, very precise, very detailed. He had been through the, the Naval War College. But he was a bit risk averse. And so what Nimitz began to use him to do is to handle all the different plans that needed to be put into place to convoy ships back and forth from Hawaii 
to the American mainland or from Hawaii to the South Pacific and Australia to ensure that these supply lines were maintained and that the right ships were in the right places at the right time. Not as much risk taking is involved in that sort of planning. It was very good for Dremel. Then it's gravitated towards the man in the center, uh, a gentleman named um, Charles McMorris. His Naval Academy classmates nicknamed him Socrates, I guess because, or the story goes, because he um, would always spout different pieces of wisdom. McMorris was very aggressive. He was very much interested in figuring out how the forces of the Pacific Fleet could begin to come to grips with the Japanese, win some victories, and start to uh, take the initiative in, in the Pacific. And he was assisted by the man on the right, uh, Lynn McCormick. The two of them were the war plans division within the Pacific Fleet. And so Nimitz uses Dremel to organize convoys and keep things working. And then he starts to work with McMorris and McCormick to try to figure out how to use his fighting forces. And so uh, McMorris and then McCormick are the ones who collaborate with Nimitz to architect the victories that are eventually won with the battles of Coral Sea and, and Midway. Nimitz also takes an interesting approach to organizing fleet to try to help accelerate learning. At the time that he took command, the fleet was starting to operate in task forces, which are very much, as the name implies, a group that is oriented towards a certain task. This was a shift away from how the fleet had been operating before. It had a battle force and it had a scouting force. And then within the battle force and the scouting force, there were hierarchies that would be responsible for essentially disseminating most effective or best practices for various ship types, for cruisers or destroyers or, or carriers like the one pictured here. And what happened with the move to task forces, it made sense, it made things more flexible, it gave Nimbus and his staff more options, but what it meant was that the people who were responsible for disseminating effective practices and gathering lessons, say for aircraft carriers, were often at sea. And they couldn't do that, they couldn't perform that job. So very quickly, after a couple of weeks, Nimitz orders each of these groups that are responsible for disseminating effective practices to establish a, a shore command. And these were called tight command. And those of you who have seen the Spotify model are gonna be familiar with visualizations like this. So the fully, or, or the solid line, reflects different task force organizations. We have 16, 11, and eight here. And then the dotted line are different type command organizations. So the, uh, the task force organization is an operational organization. This is how we get things done, this is how we execute. And to an extent, they're cross-functional in the sense that they have different ship types that do different things. But then each of the ship types is a type command. And the type command is remains ashore, assesses, lessons as they come in, sifts through them, identifies new and more effective ways to do things, and then disseminates that out as new tactics or, or new doctrine or new best practices. And this was a way in which uh, the fleet began to learn much more rapidly and, and adapt and adjust to the new ways of operating uh, that, that came about during the course of the war. So there's, there's two different networks here that I think are, are important. And one is about the staff. And the value here is ensuring that there's a diverse set of perspectives and that people on the staff are operating in roles that fit for their abilities and their disposition. And Nimitz ensures that that happens so that he can begin to delegate effectively so that he has sufficient slack to operate at the right level and keep his eye on the things that he feels are most important. And then within the fleet, there's three different networks. The slide, two slides ago, showed the two of them, right? The operational network, which is the task forces, and then this continual improvement network, which is the tight command. But there's a third that is more difficult to diagram, but it would, it, it would take place, and that is you know, ships return to harbor periodically. And there, the captains and the senior officers of various ships would come together 
at you know hotels in Hawaii or other places, and in the limited downtime that they had, they would collaborate. They would share stories. They would talk about what would work and what didn't. This happened very often uh, as the fleet began to progress westward across the Pacific and the harbors. People would come together and they would share and and, and learn. And so the pace of learning within that social network often outpaced the official documentation in the con continuous improvement network or the manuals that were being published. And it's it's interesting. This is what this uh, sort of network or this process is, is what my um, my prior book spent a lot of time on. And to me, this reflects a lot of uh, material that's in Danny Tintola's relatively recent book uh, called How Behavior Spreads. And I thought this was uh, fascinating because the point that Tintola is making is that ideas uh, or memes right, can spread really, really rapidly. Um, virally maybe is a bad word right now, but uh, you don't need a whole lot of contact in order for an idea or a tweet or something like that to spread around. However, if you wanna change how people behave, and I think we can see this to a certain extent now with the emphasis on um, self-isolation uh, or you know, holding ourselves up in our houses, which I've been doing for the past couple of weeks, it, right? That's a behavioral change. And that didn't just trigger as rapidly. It doesn't spread as rapidly as an idea. People have to be influenced by other people in their network that they respect in order to change their behavior. And Sintola makes this point. He talks about wide bridges. And, and a wide bridge is a connection that, that has sort of multiple points of influence, right? So, you know, Joey and I make a little bit of a wide bridge because we know each other. And Joey introduces me to this group. And I, I know Craig and other people in here. I've seen you before. So there's a little bit of a wide bridge between like this network and, 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 and other ones here in the, in the DC area. So we could spread behavior a little bit faster through that social influence. Uh, and so Tola talks about that. He uses a lot of different uh, proofs and models to illustrate how what he calls complex contagion or behavior uh, can spread. And the point is you can design networks to accelerate this kind of behavioral change or more substantive change. Uh, and it's not just as simple as building you know, sort of one node to, to another. So if you're interested in how to influence behavior, I, I think Centola's got a, a, a lot of valuable things to, to pull from. Now, the final thing that I want to talk about, the final main point, is about you know, psychological safety. And here I draw very much on the work of uh, Amy Edmondson and her recent book, This Fearless Organization. And she says that there's three really key things that you need to be doing if you want to establish psychological safety as a leader. And one is setting the stage, keeping people focused on you know, where are we, what's important, and, and what, is, what does that mean? And one of the things that I think is very interesting is how uh, Nimitz does this on, on different occasions. Some of the minutes of various meetings have been preserved so you can observe who is saying what and when and there are a few where it's really, really interesting how different officers start to get into an argument. Uh, they get down into the details, and Nimitz will make a comment that pulls everybody a little bit back up. And says, okay, th this is what we need to be talking about right now. This is where we need to go. And so he's doing this thing. He's setting the stage. He's keeping people focused on the outcome that they need to work together to achieve. Another thing that Edmondson argues that we should do is invite participation. And these aren't exactly the questions that Nimitz posted outside his door, but he had three questions uh, that he kept uh, publicly available. Basically, you know, feel free to come talk to me, propose an idea, and, but think about these three things first, all right? Is it likely that we're gonna succeed? Uh, what's gonna happen if we don't? And is it practical? practicable. Could we actually do it? Uh, Nemesis actual question spent more time talking about logistic feasibility, but this is really the essence of it. Are we likely to succeed? What might happen if we don't? And could we actually pull it off? And so 
the name is you use these questions to help frame conversations and invite participation, get people to come to him with ideas and think about what we might do. The third point that Edmondson makes is that there it's important to create uh, two different orientations towards failure. That is, we're going to have a variety of different failures, but uh, they could be categorized in two broad types. One are those that are unanticipated, where we didn't really know what was going to happen. So we tried a thing, and it failed. Well, now we have new lessons from that, because we didn't think it was going to fail, but it did. All right. So what can we learn? And then let's celebrate the fact that we learned, and let's add that to our knowledge base and move ahead. But then there are also attributable failures, things that we probably shouldn't have done. That is, it was in our knowledge base, and we shouldn't have taken that action if we had done a good enough job at uh, assessing what we knew, or uh, there can also be failures that are due to the wrong kind of orientation. And here, uh, Nemesis style comes forth pretty well as the war begins to continue on, because one of the things that he's very interested in is people who have a disposition like Socrates and Morris, who are aggressive, who want to try to move ahead aggressively. And those who lack that kind of orientation are oftentimes rotated out. They go back to shore-based commands or other things uh, because they are not moving in the right way. They're failing in a way that isn't, isn't along the lines that, that Nimitz is hoping to hoping to have. And so by doing these things, I contend that, that Emmett did a good job of building a psychologically safe environment within the fleet, an environment where it was relatively easy for people to speak up, offer their ideas, and actually debate the best way forward. And this happens in staff meetings, it ha this happens in other conferences, and you can see it in the way that he and others are churning through ideas within the historical record. And it, it's based on, or, or I think uh, it reinforces a lot of Edmondson's argument about the importance of framing, uh, encouraging people to participate, and taking this dual approach to failure where we celebrate the new and unanticipated learning and uh, sanction, or at least sort of find a way to, to get past the, the violations that occur that aren't aligned to the, the orientation that we're trying to create. So Trent, can I just ask you to clarify, because I think in, in common usage, we have two different meanings of the word sanction. Your, your meaning here is to sanction, uh, to uh, approve of, to allow for, right? Yeah, yeah. So here, sanction could take a, a multiple different forms. Uh, this might be, I mean, specifically in this context, what I'm thinking about is uh, there are uh, officers who are making a mistake that is due to some sort of lack of orientation or uh, an attributable failure, but they did the wrong thing. And they get uh, not rotated out. Nimitz finds ways for them to be productive, but they may get sent back to the States to a job that is better fitting to their capabilities and their disposition, right? So maybe they're helping to ensure the logistical flow of supplies and ammunition rather than uh, commanding a task force where you know lives are directly at risk. Does that help clarify? Uh, a little bit. I'm thinking of the difference between, uh, it helps clarify, I think the word is, is uh, messy because if you think of a sanctioned organization that is an approved organization um, mm. or a sanctioning body, but if you think of economic sanctions, that is a punishment. So the word has dual meanings. Yes, yes. I think this is this is a little bit more towards, I mean, I think punishment might be a little bit strong, but it, it's it take action to ensure that people recognize that that is not the kind of failure that we want to occur. Does that help? Yeah, thanks. All right, cool, cool. Yep, and I see some details about that in the chat. And here, here's a, a picture of the book, if you, if you haven't seen it already. Um, and the, the, this slide basically uh, summarizes some of the points that I've, that I've made already. Uh, so I recommend this one uh, also very much. I want to wrap it up with a little bit more about the importance of Slack. And I like some of the pictures that are in 
this sequence of, of five. This is uh, one of the things that Nimitz like to use to relax is play horseshoes. Uh, they hosted a picnic in uh, Hawaii a little bit later in the war, and here he is playing horseshoes with um, what appears to be a fairly senior enlisted man, and a bunch of other people are looking on, right? So this gives you a sense of his accessibility, his, his willingness to, to uh, be social with people, and he's finding time to do these things. He recognizes the importance of um, slack, downtime, taking distance. His schedule uh, is interesting. Uh, as things became more routine later in the war, he very deliberately crafted time, often on a daily basis, for exercise or recreation of some form or another. Uh, he would swim quite a bit, the picture in the center. He would walk almost every day. Um, when he's on a ship, obviously, you can't you know, walk up into the hills. That's the picture on the left, but on the right, um, there he and uh, one of his common walking partners, uh, a man named Raymond Spruance, are, are walking on one of the islands in the, in the Pacific, and the two of them, there are, are notes and various diaries and other memoirs about how the two of them would generally walk pretty aggressively, and uh, other staff members that they were invited to walk sometimes would have trouble keeping up with their pace which I think is kind of amusing when you think about the two of them being two of the more senior or oldest people uh, in, in the fleet. Uh, and also time for, for recreation. This is, a, this is a picture of a, a USO show on Guam pretty late in the war. And, uh, and this can be seen here with uh, a variety of other people enjoying the entertainment. And I think I, I, I summarize that with, uh, or, or bring it back to Slack, because I think a lot of these other things it's very difficult to do unless you've got the, the space and through uh, a disciplined uh, schedule uh, and effective delegation, Amos was good at creating space for himself to, to noodle through problems, to find ways to think about how best to do things, reconfigure the orientation of the fleet, and also uh, allow him to bond with Supporters and others outside of outside of work, which uh, I've got it in quotes because it's, it's hard to think of, you know, a, a, a wartime commander as ever being off work. But um, the officers who in service today, who I talk with about this, are often impressed and surprised that uh, he had so much slack time in his in his schedule. Uh, it's not a common thing today, so it's, I think it's a valuable lesson to reinforce and talk about. So. I think Slack is the way that you can make a lot of the rest of these things work, right? Use that downtime to uh, make sure that you're capitalizing on the depth of your experience or grow the depth of your experience and your perspective. Be deliberate uh, about networks. This is Sentola's message about how to uh, foster the kinds of behavioral change or learning that you want to create uh, within the organization that you're working with. Uh, make sure that you can identify lessons and then spend time on crafting psychological safety, build it, uh, encourage it. And doing these various things, I think, can create a virtuous cycle. And I think that uh, ultimately this is something that Nimitz was able to achieve. Uh, use the slack to do these other things. Uh, and then that can uh, create more opportunities for slack and faster learning, uh, more agility, and I think these are worthwhile things to be striving for and, and, and working towards. And I am happy now, uh, because we've reached the end of the presentation, uh, to entertain questions and uh, see what you uh, got out of it or what you'd like to talk about. Ah, uh, go back to the Slack is the blue slide. Yes, there we go. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Trent. Thank you very much for this awesome presentation. Um, sometimes I have people, I don't know if people want to do it, unmute and clap. <laughs> Is that, <laughs> you have to do that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. There we go. There we go. Thank you very I, much. That, that is, I'm noticing that is one of the things that is much more difficult in the virtual environment. Like if I were in front of all of you and speaking, I could see more, I could get more feedback. You know, yeah. people would laugh at, you may all be laughing or doing things like that, of course, but if you're muted, I can't hear that. Uh, so <laughs> the feedback is not as immediate, uh, but thank you. Thank you for that. 
Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you coming tonight and speaking into what I call the tin can, where it's like, I'm not sure if this is being heard clearly. I'm trying my best to get the message across, right? That's, that's my experience with these things. Um, I have one question for you, then I'd, I'd love to hear other questions from other people in the, in the uh, Zoom room today. Uh, you had mentioned how Nimitz could pick out people's core strengths or kind of figure out where their sweet spot was, and he would bring them into that role. How do you think he did that? How do you think he pinpointed someone for you know, planning versus, you know, uh, battle theater type things? Oh, wow. That is a, that is a magic question. Uh, I don't know for sure. My suspicion is that he had developed a, um, a skill at this. Well, let me back, backpedal a little bit. Uh, first, we have to recognize the, the, the Navy of the, the uh, 20s and 30s you know, sort of when, when the missus moving up to the ranks, it's not very big, right? Uh, particularly the officer corps. There aren't that many of them. There's only a right. couple thousand. So he's, it's small enough that he can begin to familiarize himself with these individuals who know their strengths and their weaknesses over time, right? It's not just, oh, I, I'm now in a new situation and here are these people. He knew who they all were. Hmm. In addition to that, remember right before uh, assuming Right before the war breaks out, he's the head of the Bureau of Navigation, which today they call the Bureau, or eventually they call the Bureau of Personnel. Uh, so he's finding jobs for officers. He's making sure they go to the right billet, the right next station. Uh, so he has to be familiar with their skill sets and their dispositions from that point. A few years prior, he had been assistant head of that same bureau. So mm -hmm. this is his second round of, of service trying to figure out what officers are good for what. So I think he's got a lot of experience with it that he built, that he draws from. But then he also seems to be very, uh, sort of a quick judge or a quick study. Like um, I, I had the pictures, let me go back a little bit. Um, oops, I'm still on that thing. You know, I've got these pictures where he's uh, walking with uh, spruance about on the ship and on the island. And he didn't seem to have a whole lot of familiarity with uh, Spruance, but in mid-1942, he, he brings Spruance on as his new chief of staff. And so he seems to be able to suss out uh, people's skills and ability fairly quickly. Um, and I think that's part of it as well. And I don't know how you teach that or, or how you learn that. I think that's just some of us are really adept at that. Um, and I'm not sure that, that, that all of us are. Awesome. Wow, here, some more cool questions. I don't know, Joey, if you want to follow up to that, but we've got more questions appearing in the chat. I want to make yeah. sure that we... I think you did time. a great job. Yeah, thanks, Trent. I think you answered that well. Um, so let's start with uh, Craig Eddy. I think he was the first one to, uh, to chime in with a, a new question. And uh, his question was, as a Fed contractor, the notion of Slack can be frowned upon because paid by the hour, any advice for fostering or cultivating Slack for both break from work and space for dealing with oh shit moments which will occur, but can be planned for. Yeah, I, I like, uh, Craig, I like what you've chosen to capitalize. Um, <laughs> so this is one of the reasons I mentioned uh, David's Wood, David Woods' material. Uh, and it's, it's in that first slide about Slack. Let's just back up there very quickly. Um, Woods, I think, makes some very effective arguments. His papers tend to be a little bit more uh, intellectual. He doesn't have a book, as far as I know, but he emphasizes, you know, it, it's not called slack in his terminology. It's called this adaptive capacity, which is the term that I've started to use because I think slack has uh, a negative connotation. I mean, also it's a chat thing now, but, um, you know, we think about slack as, as downtime, as inefficiency, as uh, lack, we're not getting the most for our money. Woods, frames it differently. Uh, adaptive capacity is what an organization needs in order to overcome unanticipated challenges, right? The surprise is going to happen. The oh shit moment is going to happen. Uh, how do you deal with it? How do you make sure that you've got capacity to deal with it? And I like the way he uses the term capacity. I think that's a, a valuable argument. I, I think we could, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of tragic to, to think about it, but it's probably all in our minds right now, right? There, there are not enough slack and a whole variety of systems, and we're seeing that with the illness that is spreading. 
And uh, if you don't have the slack, then sometimes you can't make choices that you otherwise want to be able to make. Hmm. Uh, and so those kinds of uh, arguments, I think, are, are useful. Uh, I like something else that David Wood says, which is that we've all got organizations and individuals have sort of a model of how things work. And there will be surprises. There will be things that challenge the model. And if you don't have adaptive capacity, then the model breaks and you don't know what to do. And it takes a long time to recover. If you do, you have more leeway. You have more time uh, to be able to deal with the, the, the broken model. Um, so there, I, there are a number of different ways that you could come at it. Um, I can't try not to argue against it rationally, but instead use analogies uh, that get people thinking about the benefits of, of having uh, adaptive capacity. I hope that's helpful. Very much. Thanks, Trent. Mm -hmm. Cool. And uh, Trent, we got a question from <clears throat> Teggy Thomas, and she asked, what organizations or groups do you see they're practicing or implementing some of what you just described from Nimitz's uh, work? Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's tough. I was not anticipating that one. Uh, <laughs> I, I think a, I think a variety of organizations are, are trying to do different aspects of, of this. One of the things I, I'm going to steer this, I'm sorry, Teggy, but I'm going to steer this towards not doing it, uh, which is an easier <laughs> question for me to answer given, given the work that I do. Uh, but one of the things that I think is powerful about this framing is the idea of, of a staff. And I think a lot of leaders in business, uh, oftentimes in government also, not, not um, military government, but the civilian government, have trouble with this concept. The idea that you need a group of individuals uh, who are sort of part of your strategic advisory team, that might be how we, how we call it, but a staff who have diverse perspectives and make sure that they are surfacing those two uh, people in leadership positions so that they can more rapidly anticipate uh, the model breaks or the the oh no moments that, that Craig was talking about. Um, because a lot of leaders that I work with or consult with tend to feel like they're in the position that they are because they're so skilled and they're so smart and they're so capable. Uh, and they oftentimes fail to recognize how important it is to be gaining that diversity of, of perspective, in part because, well, that's slack and we're trying to be efficient, but also I think a lot of it has to do with people's orientation, people's assumptions about their own, their own skills. Uh, a lot of, so that's, that's one big thing that I think is, is important and I try to, to stress to people who, whenever they're receptive. Uh, organizations are doing some of these things. I think the thing that we see most common is uh, sort of the learning network approach that I'm going to go back to sort of the slide about uh, that's akin to the Spotify model, this sort of thing. I think a lot of organizations have gotten pretty adept at this kind of thing now. Like uh, we're going to have teams and then we're going to have uh, guilds or uh, chapters, whatever we happen to call them, so that we can grow expertise and then also execute effectively and, and, and uh, learn in a variety of different paradigms. So I think this is something that is being practiced by a lot of different organizations. I think a number of the other things are spotty. Awesome, thanks Trent. And I think you've written a book on this topic, right? I wrote one that covered more or less this. Yes. Wow. So I, I don't have it in, in the slide deck, but if people don't mind me just holding up a copy, because I have one on my desk, uh, I wrote this, which uh, talks about learning and innovation in, in the U.S. Navy in uh, the first half of the 20th century, essentially. Um, and it's not specifically about Nimitz, but it is about the Navy as a, as a system and, and how it learns. Wow. Wow. Uh, and Susan Levin had asked a question for you. She said, how did Nimitz flex his leadership style to deal with different situations? Were there some examples that you could share with us? Yeah, uh, there are. And, uh, but I think a lot of it comes down to this, uh, this setting the stage piece. 
because there's there's different uh, setting the stage. The point that I was trying to make here was framing you know context, making sure that people keep their eye on the the goals that we're trying to achieve and orienting towards that rather than getting mired in in uh, detailed discussion. But there were definitely times where Nimitz was more assertive, uh, where he was sort of uh, this is what we're going to do. Um, we're going to try to overcome this specific challenge. Uh, an example of that is uh, the way in which the the, the uh, planning for um, the operation that uh, went into the the Marshall Islands and seized the atoll of, of Kwajalein was was planned. A lot of Nimitz's subordinates felt that there had to be incremental steps uh, before occupying uh, Kwajalein, and uh, he had worked with his intelligence organization, he had worked with his logistic team, and he understood that first, the, the uh, sort of uh, the communication hub of, of the Japanese in the Marshall Islands was on that atoll, so it would be a very important objective to see. And second, that uh, logistically, it was gonna be extremely difficult to mount two operations to seize islands within, within the Marshalls. Uh, if it, if there were two operations, it, there would be a long turnaround time between them because of the amount of shipping and so on. So in the uh, conference to discuss how to do that, uh, rather than having a, a sort of broad set of ideas and allowing the decision to emerge from it, Nimitz was much more directive. He allowed everybody to say their thoughts. You know, what do you all think? What should we do? Uh, but the way uh, that the, the minutes from that have not been recorded, but the anecdotes that survive are very much, well, we go around the room, everybody says what they think. Most people think, well, we shouldn't try to go to Kwajalein directly. And Nimitz is the last one to speak. And he says, all right, great. I hear what you all say. This is what we're going to do. Uh, so th there were there were times where this setting the stage was uh, not just framing, but also sort of committing to or setting a, a very specific direction that was, that was more directed. All right, thank you. Um, let's see. And kind of two questions are the same nature. Uh, Actually, when, oh, Joy, can, can, I, can I say another one, uh, yeah, another example part. that I think is yeah. really interesting? Because, because something else, so more to the opposite end, and, and when people, particularly when, um, Officers today hear this story, they, they uh, are often surprised by it. So it might take a little bit of time to explain, but um, in World War II, the Navy introduced something called the Combat Information Center, which was a way, a new shipboard organization to make sense of all information that was coming to the ship because there were new technologies, high frequency radios, radars, sonar, etc. And the established shipboard organization had all that information going up established communication channels. And what it meant was it was very hard to rapidly assess all that information, synthesize it, and take action on it. And it led to slower decision making. And this was obvious from action reports and other things that, that Nimitz and his staff were able to peruse and see. And they knew they needed a solution. And Nimitz was directed again, but the way he's directed is, I think, really, really interesting. He issues an order in November of, of 1942. It's about a page and a half long, and it basically says every ship in the fleet is going to create a combat information center. This is what the combat information center is going to do. It's going to gather all this information, it's going to synthesize it, and it's going to provide it in actionable format to the captain and the ship's uh, other uh, command systems. And then it stops because it doesn't say anything about how to do it. And so what happened is all the different ships start exploring, well, okay, we got to do this. How are we going to do it? I don't know. And different ships you know, like take over different compartments to try to piece together how best to accomplish this. And what it leads to is this series of parallel experimentation within the fleet to problem solve to best accomplish this. And meanwhile, the people who are responsible for best practices of the combat information center are observing the reports that come back from the ships of the fleet, making decisions about what actually is effective practice and what is not, and then promulgating those lessons back out. And so it, it, the emphasis on parallel 
uh, experimentation leads to really la rapid learning. And so that's directive, but it's directive. Th thanks, Trent. That's awesome. That's a good explanation. Oh, wait. I think your headphones. OK, so one second, folks, while Trent gets his headphones back up and running again. I think the power just died on them. So one second or two. Getting there. He's having one of those moments. Yep, yep. He's having a uh, COVID-19 moment. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can. Yep. Your batteries, it sounded like your batteries just uh, passed out there. Yeah, this thing just died. <laughs> yep. Right in the middle of a good thought. Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. So, um, yeah, that, that that's really amazing. I think you told me that story before about the Combat Information Center and how they just said, you guys could figure it out. And they did it all in parallel and they did their own unique way, their own variation. So that's that kind of nice autonomous level of control where it's like, you guys are on your own. You've got to figure out how to fit this into this box and operate this way. So that's yes. really cool. Yeah, I think I have told you that before. Yeah, it's a good story. Um, so I think two people had asked similar kinds of questions. One person came in a little late and didn't quite know um, uh, a little bit about you, didn't know uh, that much about you. And then someone else, uh, four, had asked uh, if you studied anything else besides um, the naval history. So anything on military, uh, Wild Bill Donovan, uh, Da Vinci, <laughs> anything like that, you know. Uh, all right, so a little bit more uh, about me. Sorry that this is going to be redundant for those people who uh, were here at the beginning. But uh, yeah, I'm a, an Agilist, uh, a fellow at uh, Excella in Virginia, or in Arlington, uh, Virginia. Um, I work as, a, as an Agile coach for a lot of our uh, clients. Um, and uh, also consults at the sort of the management and an executive level. Uh, so that's the day job. The history is a hobby, uh, but it's it's more than just a, a hobby. It's uh, something I invest a lot of time in. Um, obviously, it's uh, something that's very important to me. And I really like how I can uh, create presentations like this that uh, draw on the knowledge that I've gathered from history and also my experience working with modern organizations and trying to improve or accelerate agility and learning and dovetailing those things together. It's really uh, fun to, for me to to draw those kinds of parallels. Uh, so that's a bit uh, on my background. The focus, uh, what I've decided to make my focus is is the, the U.S. Navy, the early 20th century, um, because as I'm sure any of you who have gotten into history know, uh, if you really want to get into primary source material and and wrestle with the ideas of the time, you you've got to have some sort of uh, a specialty or a focus. I have studied uh, military history a little bit more broadly, but uh, not to the not to the same degree. I mean, I can talk about other navies during this time. I can talk about different sort of military theories during this time period, the, the 19th and 20th centuries, but uh, not to the same level of, of primary source or archival detail. Cool, thanks. Um, I think the uh, just to clarify a little bit for the historical question there about researching other topics, uh, have you found other historical insights leading to innovation or leading into some direction of innovation that you say, ah, this helps innovation? Um, well, one thing that uh, I have spent a, a little bit of time on, um, some of you are probably familiar with Stephen Mungay and uh, The Art of Action. Mm. And what he looks at is uh, the what was Prussian and then later German uh, military uh, armies thinking and, and uses that as an avenue to talk about how modern organizations should become more, more agile or could become more agile. And he posits three gaps. I don't remember what they all are off the top of my head, but, but essentially it's a, what uh, Bunge is emphasizing is the importance of sort of high level direction and, and mission command and then back briefing to make sure that everybody's on the, on the same page. One of the things that I've tried to show in my work is that um, if we're going to look at, at, at effective uh, agility or, or 
decision making and learning in military organizations. We shouldn't just look at the Germans, which is what Bungay did, because uh, there are there are others that did other things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Makes a lot of sense too. And that's that's something I keep kind of poking around on personally, just as a small tangent here, is that uh, I'm fascinated with supply chain logistics and how you can look at that with a lens against the different wars and see how did they survive, how did they fail because of just simply supply chain challenges, right? That's, that's just one small slant right there. Um, let's see, I think that is most of the questions. If I miss something, anyone's welcome to unmute and, and ask Trent the question. I was just going through our, our chat here and just checking the log and I think we covered quite a bit. Yeah, there's a, there's a bit from Ford about read Team of Rivals by uh, Doris Keene's good, good one. Um, yeah, that's excellent. <laughs> we would definitely recommend that. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a great one. And uh, let's see, anything else? I think that might be it. Yeah. And, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. This was a fun uh, presentation, Trent. I'm really glad you were able to show up and, and make this happen. <laughs> right. You know, it's, it's the Zoom effect, right? You're actually able to show up in your office and chaos wasn't happening inside your house. So you made it. And, and thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. Um, in the future, we'll try and do a little raffle thing that we normally do, but right now we don't have the raffle thing set up virtually. Uh, oh, for those man. of you guys, I know, right? And, and if I had connected with you early enough, I would have said, let's use your book as a raffle because someone would definitely want to read that out of this group. Uh, just as a reminder, folks, uh, we do have, um, let's see, our Slack channel out there. So if you look on our meetup page, you'll find that we have an open Slack channel to discuss different topics that we have here at this meetup. And also we're trying to dive a little bit more into experimentation at this time. So if there's something from this that you wanna try and experiment, let us know, because we'd love to know how it works out for you. And we have a little experimentation uh, channel there in our Slack channels. So if you have a moment, take a look at it. I'm gonna try and do a little better job of promoting, promoting that before our next uh, meetup in April. Uh, and Christine, I think you have the, the person uh, Who's going to be the next one? I believe you know who that is. I do. It's uh, so we're going to speed together on April 23rd, and we are going to hear from Manjeet Singh, and he's going to tell us something about team structure. Cool. So, Excellent. Yeah, more to come on that. So awesome. hope to see you all next month. Yeah, great. And uh, thank you all. Uh, by the way, there's a little something extra there in the chat window just now from uh, Four for the COVID business. So. Uh, Hopefully you can find some information there that's useful. Thank you all for showing up and uh, have a great night. Thanks, Thank thanks, you. Trent. Right. Thank you. thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Trent. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Great. Thanks for. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Trent. All right, thanks guys. See ya. Bye, Joey. All right, bye-bye. Thank you.